Hey everyone, I'm super excited to be speaking to Lucy Easthope. Lucy has written a beautiful and insightful book, When the Dust Settles. The book is part memoir and recounts her life as a professional in disaster planning and recovery. I've had the privilege of hearing Lucy in person and she is as wonderful as I would have thought. You can do two things if you're listening. You can follow her on Twitter, if that's your thing, and you can buy her book, which I very much recommend. Lucy, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to start at the future, actually, and I'm going to ask, what gives you hope? So you wrote in your book, the value of a horizon to swim towards, the importance of trying to build something afterwards, to stay living, breathing, there had to be a purpose, a future, a bluer sky. And I thought about that, about one of your themes in the book of being hope as well as loss. Uh, and I thought I'd ask, what gives you hope? Oh, that's a brilliant question. And I think I think one of the things is this, this, this ability to be able to uh, bat back and forth between really terrible thoughts and risks, which we have to do in emergency planning, and then just take incredible joy from a moment in the day and I find people are, are absolutely hooked on that and they're desperately trying to see if that's authentic so I, I keep my hope I think very uh boundary you know I I know there'll be dark times both uh personally and also for the world ahead but lots of lots of little things give me hope and um I think in the same way as when you see extremists in in a, as frequently as I do you also see uh, reasons to be cheerful as often as I do anybody in my friendship group whoever has a baby <laughs> knows how much I enjoy that event and uh, I, I spend far too much of my money on baby things I find I find children and, and babies and futures and the idea of something has to something has to have a point going forward being very very uh, purposeful um and also people are great I think that's the other thing you know and my work is one of the greatest privileges of it is just seeing people being great a lot so that gives me a lot of hope I often say that because sometimes I get accused of hopium which yeah. is sort of being I tend to say I'm cautiously optimistic about many things around people and about the fact that although there are a lot of bad things and there's a lot of bad things that are going to continue we've been slowly improving across many dimensions and I've also seen people at their kind of best and also at their worst so I have a confession I almost didn't read your book yeah. and yeah. Uh, that was because I've been a bystander in about five disasters of which four of which you cover in your book and I wasn't sure I wanted to revisit them but full disclosure I should probably recount them because yes, please. Um, it's kind of quite likely so um, I live in the shadow of Grenfell that morning mm -hmm. I opened the door to ash raining down on me yeah. I was near Liverpool Street over 7-7 seven -seven. Yeah. I had left the beaches in Thailand the very morning the tsunami struck I was in Manhattan over 9-11 and I heard the Downing Street uh, mortar attack. I was kind of around the corner, which is probably one of the smallest of the uh, events. Uh, but I was quite young then, so it left quite an impression. And I guess I can add a six in the sense that we've all lived through the start Absolutely. of the COVID pandemic and it echoes through today. Yeah. Uh, and people's, people kind of ask, oh, that seemed kind of unlikely. But actually, I, I think it really isn't. These are kind of predictable risks predictable surprises right that's this 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 thing on that and we all live with I think you said the when the not the if this idea that tragedies happen around us every day but I think we'll cover those but I, I wanted to start actually with your youth as we go in through to this because I had this sense that your activism started really early your sense of the importance of resilience the questions that you ha had and you spent some of your uh, youth with work experiences with with coroners and can you tell me about kind of how you started and your activism and your youth and your interest in this? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 like like you introducing, you know, your experience there, I think a lot of people are touched statistically more than might seem uh, you know, uh possible by by events, but also I think certain people tune into them. You know, sometimes people will say to me that they realized only afterwards that they were on the periphery of something. But there's other people who who feel them very acutely. And I think that's that's very important as well. So for me, actually, um, I was profiled in The New Yorker in the summer. And for that, my dad was interviewed and he said the first one he he really remembered me becoming very agitated by was was when I was about six or seven, which was the Bradford City fire disaster. And then a couple of years after that, we were on a school trip. 
ship and that's sort of where the book starts really um we sailed past the herald of free enterprise which was a passenger um ferry on its side uh that had um gone to set sail with its bow doors open and uh, in a massive safety failing and we uh passed it a couple of weeks after the uh initial uh tragedy but they were still conducting recovery work and what my dad says in the interview, you know, is these were very, very big questions from a very small person. These were this was somebody really uh, activated and interested and worried and desperate to understand where the where where people were now, where where the where the dead gone, where had the living gone, where was everybody, was they you know were they okay? And then uh, as I go into most detail in that first chapter in the book, is um, my dad and my mom actually were teachers in Liverpool and Birkenhead. And they had uh, school children at the Hillsborough match on the 15th of April, 1989. And I had classmates. I was in year six and I had classmates at the game. And that was the one that, that you know, from that moment on, really, I think I'm changed forever. And, and I think there's a lot of discussion in modern times now about the ripple effect. So I'm not at the match. My parents aren't at the match. Uh, we 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 don't see the things that that many of our um, fellow community members saw. But we're very affected by what it does to those families, and also we're very affected by what it does to our community. So I talk about driving into um, Liverpool with my parents soon after and people are standing on the edges of the road outside news agents and burning copies of the Sun newspaper who have perpetuated some very terrible myths about the fans behavior and so you've got this you, you know you, you like many like many experiences I think that you see in activism they, they, they start young and my dad you know uttered some words um that really stayed with me he got angry and angrier really very very sort of gentle but passionate man angrier about the situation and he said you know somebody needs to sort this and what he meant was you know this isn't fair on the fans and the families and I took that as a huge direction <laughs> and 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 that that shaped me and I became a very activist teenager and off I went to study law because I was going to make things different for the families and that just stayed as my kind of mantra throughout my my life really um, we recently met briefly in Liverpool, and so for those on the video, I have a a, a purple uh, a oh, purple bin, the purple wheelie bin, a little bit blue on the that's video, quite but blue, actually, yeah, uh, but it is actually purple. Um, uh, you know, as a as a symbol, I think <laughs> the ripple effect was really interesting, and and there's some just a small second order detail which I just recall now in Manhattan for those of us who were there. We really remember the smell, this yeah. visceral, yeah. Atta well, attack on you. Well, a kind of uh, air attack. Yeah. And some of us are still kind of triggered by it now. The kind of yeah. air ash burning. And there's actually all of these pollution effects as well. And for those who are sort of remember and things, it, it's one of the things which, which link us. And there's this kind of ripple in terms of a shared memory of that. And I guess one of the other things is the personal effects, the belongings, which has been a really important uh, part of your work. And I think you've you've sort of said something like, remember every disaster by its personal effects. The aftermath yeah. is all about these, I guess on the one hand, you think of them as small items, uh, but incredibly important. How did you come to sort of find why that was so important and why it's such an important part of your work today? Yeah, so when I was at university, I, I discovered this this wonderful group of mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and brothers and sisters who'd lost their loved ones in disasters in, in the UK in the 80s and 90s or in disasters overseas that, that had affected British citizens. And, the, and also within that, there were survivors of those disasters. And they were very generous with their time. And I'm joining them to listen and learn in the, in the late 90s. And one of the themes that's coming up from multiple disasters, you know, Britain was hit by just a series of what we call kind of mass fatality incidents at that time was how poorly the families were treated in so many ways so in terms of information and care you know tea urns that said for police only so that families couldn't get a cup of tea all kinds of poor treatment but there were some specific things that stood out around things like the care of the deceased and then specifically the care of the personal effect so one of the things when families don't get a, a body back or the body is difficult to view or, or it, it's damaged, the, the personal effects take on a, a much greater meaning. 
And we were seeing everything from personal effects being thrown away. And this was an international problem. Uh, the Americans had a very similar problem in the 1990s. You know, personal effects were being thrown away, or if they were returned at all, they were often returned um, without without warning to the families. Uh, the families have the right to have them back as they are, but they also now under legislation in America have the right to have them cleaned or, 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 or repaired. But you know, we were seeing things like you know black bin bags being delivered to families with the personal effects in. And that seemed like something I could work on. And ironically, when I went to work much more in the field with a, with a private firm, that was one of their specific areas of contracting. So I moved into specifically being in charge of taking care of those personal effects. And that is the greatest privilege, you know, the custody of those items and the, the tender care of those items. It's actually the part of the work that I find hardest. Um, it's interesting to hear you talk about what we kind of technically call olfactory trauma so, so or olfactory memory. So for me, olfactory memory is my most uh, my most kind of likely to provoke a, a fast memory or a fast image, as you say, aviation fuel, smoke, ash. Um, there's other things for me I talk about in the book, a particular cleaning fluid. And so these are those moments that kind of stop you in your tracks. And the personal effects, um, one of the ways that they kind of linger in your memory is you're, they're often so mundane, you know, and you'll end up sort of going home that night and seeing exactly the same thing that you've been working on to return to a family so I talk about biro pens and water bottles and wash bags and um the the other thing about sort of attributing them to particular types of incidents is that incidents um I, I, when I you know reach into my memory trove of of experiences I'm linking uh, particular types of things to a particular event so you mentioned 2005 and the, the the four bombings across London and and generally there the deceased were quite quite young young commuters uh, in their mid-20s and so it was a sort of commuter's personal effects it was a, a packed lunch it was uh the big Nokia phones it was paperback books that you know bit dog-eared that you would read on you know <laughs> resting against somebody else's shoulder on the tube for other incidents, one that I didn't personally do, but I attended the debrief at Interpol for that always stays with me is a bus crash of school children where every child had a, an iPod shuffle. Um, so different incidents come with a sort of story of the loved ones that are lost and affected. I have I keep a memory box um, a lot of on my travels, not on from every disaster, but for instance, I have a, I have a shell from that tie. Uh, beach mm. and I think this link to memory also to smell I guess it goes to the amygdala and the deep parts of our brain yeah. Um, yeah. but when I talk to friends I do think that some form of however you want to do it memory box or taking things which live with you so you can uh, sort of treasure or recall or compartmentalize those moments um, I think can be an important thing to do one thing which strikes me about your work is how amazingly interdisciplinary you are I think there's been particularly in hierarchies and organizations I guess it goes that way you know you have a silo police do policing and doctors do doctoring mm. and and you sit around all of this and in particular you represent uh, the victims so well and you kind of just calmly seem to hold your ground I'm sure it's not calm <laughs> all the time you know you just have well, this is right, and this makes sense to me. And so just by your very presence and knowing a lot about these, um, you can kind of cause an intervention just by just by being a, a little bit, just saying, like, this is going to be a voice uh, in the room. Uh, did the interdisciplinary nature kind of just come about slightly by accident, or you just seem to know a lot about a lot of things, and then you're <laughs> in the situation... <laughs> where it makes where it makes a difference and yeah. it just seems to be so rare and also just so amazing um Talk and so that. frustrating as well you know right. like <laughs> when you're in a university environment I've had many the research coordination manager sit me down and say like Lucy what is your discipline like where are your where are we going to go for the ref grant you know the big grants in H in HE what are we going to do with you because um the, the interdisciplinarity now it makes perfect sense but you know it looks it can look very scattergun so my degrees are in law in disaster management and risk and in and in medicine a PhD in medicine 
And so it looks like, you know, sometimes I, I asked my mum just, just two weeks ago, like, did I ever look like I didn't have a plan? You know, certainly a couple of family friends are like, what are you doing in your 20s? She's like, I think I always felt you had a plan. Um, but but one of the things, you're right, it's that oh, you have so many tabs open at once, so many things that you're drawing on. And do you know what I love about it now <laughs> is that there was a funny moment. I was giving some advice last week and somebody who didn't know me very well, because I obviously, I, you know, when I'm, when I'm starting to chat to somebody, it'll be quite gentle. It'll be quite um, uh, kind of light. I know I'm going to have to raise some difficult subjects. And I started to chat in a sort of normal way. It wasn't a scholar's way with loads of citations. And the person in the room said, uh, you know, do you have an evidence base? Because you've said about 14 things there. What's your evidence base? And literally everybody in the room went, <gasps> <laughs> and it's like a marvel comic they were like don't like don't do that don't feed her after midnight <laughs> do you know like don't ask her for the evidence base because of course there's an evidence base and as you say it's drawn from about 150 disciplines so it's it's a lot of work the two things that this brain holds on to is disaster is anything anything at all from any field everything from educational psychology to to chemistry to um to kind of the business world all these different kinds of things it will hold on to it will retain it will connect it will think how to use them that and celebrity gossip it remembers <laughs> nothing else and that and, and and what I think even doing things like, you know, having the book out there, prompting conversations, it's prompted conversations with family, particularly about how annoying that is. I can't let go of a, it's terrible if you, if, if I buy the Sunday papers, because I can make every article relevant to what I'm doing. I am very, I'm very lucky to have academic positions because then I have access to every potential journal pretty much that I could want and that's how I operate and one of the things I would say um is uh and, and I met a chief executive re recently very very impressive woman and she did something similar she gave herself a couple of hours in the morning for kind of reading time the kind of you know what was going to be their articles and you have to you have to find ways to absorb lots and lots of information very quickly and that would be one piece of advice that I would have the other thing I've loved and I know it's not always terribly popular is the discovery I discovered it. I came to it late but the discovery of social media for me because if you curate your feed well you can get that digested to you uh, you know a thousand times an hour and I love that but I know it's not a very popular thing sometimes to do <laughs> well you, and you straddle all of that I mean I um I don't know how many people have have actually read and download did your academic papers but I, I read the recent one I have to confess I understood the abstract and maybe around <laughs> the first page or two and then you lost me um, essentially on <laughs> that's how it should be in <laughs> academic and writing. the philological <laughs> study on on DVI um, on basically victim yeah. identification yeah. And, and all of this and it just struck me that there are a lot of people working on this and it flows through and in, into into the front line the other thing I got from your book though is this idea that um, I guess we have it, it's a common sense idea that nothing really goes to plan. So yeah. you've got to have, you've got to have the plan, but somehow then realize that it isn't going to go to plan. And that again, that's one of your uh, skills, which comes across this just ability to um, put forward the the things which, which you would know, like the, or would you, which you might know if you could be objective and calm, but you wouldn't necessarily know in the, in the moment, like the cup of tea or the clean clothes, or that that very human yeah. element which doesn't come through on on the papers. Um, and again, have you just develop that through time. And how would you talk to people about um, making through that element comes through in 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 however we go when we're either responding or being out in the world. That's such a, oh, such a lovely question. And the answer always becomes very clear to me when I'm with, uh, you know, kind of groups of my kin, when I'm with with my aunties and, and my older cousins. And they're just this mass group of nurturers. And so in our family, I think there was always, you did perhaps reach into areas that were perhaps a little bit more personal. Have you got your cup of tea? You know, a lot of my female matriarchs are teachers. So it's like, have you got a coat? You know, all the questions they'd ask a year seven, have you got a coat? Have you, have you had a cup of tea? There was, there's a lot of nurturing goes in in our family there's a lot of interest in in everybody's welfare in our family I, you know I was out with a big gang of them recently and I thought yeah this is where a lot of this comes from and actually one of the things that I've learned going out into the world and obviously you 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 see how other people operate is that actually can be quite intrusive <laughs> like saying to somebody 
you know, have you had a chance to get the loo? Have you had a shower? Have you had food? Those aren't necessarily normal questions. I can't about to ask you all those questions now. They are really good crisis interventions. So they're really good to go, okay, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm going to go really basic here. I'm going to show you where the loos are. I'm going to show you, you know, make sure you've had a cup of tea before we put you into an interview with the police or anything like that. So family was a, was a great uh, training for that. I think the other thing is the ability to look slightly into the future um, of where something's going to go. So one of my most controversial um, topics over the last year uh, and the book's given me a lovely platform to, to to try out other discussions is that when disasters happen, some of the worst things you can do are things that feel like they're absolutely the right thing to do. So I have a hashtag cash not stuff, which is about not donating all of the old things from your back bedroom to the nearest disaster. They often become the second disaster. A much better thing is to donate cash. And so one of the things that I would find is I would I would mention that and people be horrified. You know, this is us showing care. This is something we want to do. So Often where the plan fails is not because it's gone horribly wrong or because it's so, you know, so, so unsurvivable with the situation. It's because people are perhaps doing things that feel right in the moment, but not doing a, a longer term risk analysis. And I think the public sector struggle with that. Often when I'm working with the private sector, they because, for example, their financiers and their legal teams will tend to have a long range view. They are often easier to brief with me going, hang on, there's a hidden consequence. Um, and what I'm learning and still learning, I learn constantly, is that there's a real responsibility to playing that role. Um, I, I, you know, somebody asked me the other day, they wanted to uh, write a briefing uh, on an incident that's just happened. And there was just too much information in the briefing. It wasn't going to land. And I advised on two or three things that needed to come out. And afterwards, I thought, that's quite a big thing you just did there because those two or three things I, I've, I've obviously said put them in another paper that goes second but you're making some big choices and people are kind of looking at you going um what's the right thing to do here um and and you have to we've talked about the evidence base but you also have to have mentors that you check in with and and like so 11 o'clock last night I was speaking to a colleague that is a sense maker for me and that's a really important part of this as well that's really fascinating and that part about cash really resonates as well because partly when you're reaching out to help people you're thinking in your own shoes sort of like oh what would I like and you know where am I sitting whereas often from the other person when they have nothing anymore they need to kind of be empowered to make their own choices not given by some other direction or something like that completely that, al that also leads me to think another theme about your book is so you deal a lot on the near term and the aftermath and then the kind of medium term uh, a little bit like that and then for some things the sense of justice and the fighting for those and then there is the kind of medium to very long term these echoes I mean in Liverpool you have the echo today I, I think the city will be forever shaped by really? uh, what happened so that's going to be that uh, Manhattan is shaped I think forevermore uh, with that really and you you have this uh, Welsh term, which I'm uh, going to mispronounce, because is it hiraith? This hiraith, kind of yeah, hiraith. yeah, beautiful term, hiraith. This longing for a place to which there is no return. I think you say an echo of something that can never be found or something that no longer exists. And I'm going to wrap it round as well, because uh, my son is autistic and there are some things which disappear from his life, like uh, trains or other things. And I see this in other parts which have been my life and they are no longer about some things when you do break you can't really put them mm -hmm. back uh, together and and I think when I came across that term I thought that is exactly right uh, but what would you say in your interactions for that what we should do for this sense of uh, missing the sense of whole and either at the kind of city organizational level or on the on the people level now that you've been to so many of these places and, and keep them alive with you what what do you think we should do with this uh, heart sickness for something that no longer exists? 
Well, I think the first thing you have to do is acknowledge Hiraith. And it's something that doesn't sit well with, with, say, framings of modern mental health. You know, there was one of the things that I'm growing increasingly concerned about when I do respond initially to a disaster is is, is rhetoric from both kind of some, some mental health professionals, but also politicians, that this will be overcome, this will be bounced back from, you know, that resilience is you forgetting or parceling or being able to, to move to the next stage. And Hiraith stays with you, you know, and I... I think that's a really important recognition, and and the the certain parts of the book flowed very easily. And Hiraith was a was a part of the book that flowed easily because it was the word that that was working most for me when I was meeting with both community groups and responders in Grenfell. And so this was a, a diaspora of, of multiple communities, many languages, and this one word was doing this work. It was connecting everybody's feeling. Everybody loved it, but also was desperate about it because I wasn't offering a fix. There is no fix for Hiraith. And there is, with with a lot of things, I think similarly, bereavement or a massive uh, career change, there is a loss of the life before. And what you watch people do in the early stages of something like bereavement is kind of try and fight it. And you also watch the people around them try and fight it. And they say, you know, I, I, for example, in my work, I've often seen people interact with very, very newly widowed young women and people are like, well, we can get you that life back. You know, we're way too early and way too soon people are saying, there's still a life, we'll find the life. People are very, very desperate to try and convince you that it will be okay, which is which is understandable. But Hiraith doesn't go anywhere. And uh, a lot of the conversations that I have with, with communities affected by disaster stems from a life before and a life after. And they will still see moments of joy. They will still see moments of hope. They might like their new leisure centre better than the one before, but it doesn't mean that Hiraith is not very, very permanent. The other thing I really like about the use of that word particularly is it's a kind of direct challenge to where I go on in the book, which is the sort of modern spin of emergency management. You know, we will, I was quite shocked at an event that a couple of weeks ago and we're still talking about minimising the effect of these events. The ultimate role of emergency planning in the UK is to kind of minimise these events so that they almost feel uh, like speed bumps in the road. And you're like, are you kidding me? These are so fundamental to the fabric of of society and also the way you described your experiences. They're so fundamental to the fabric of you that I don't believe that how we measure whether something has come back from somewhere is their ability to forget it. My my much truer test is their ability to live alongside the Hirai. Uh, I That really resonates with me. I mean, part of my experience on uh, with my Thai friends and also in Manhattan is that uh, I keep their stories alive by including them in my own. That's something that you sort of talk about yeah, in the book. Absolutely. And there is this acknowledgement about how it shapes us and that we that we don't forget. Um, Completely. We have this around Grenfell as well. So this idea, uh, that idea that it uh, that it shapes us um, on that by keeping their stories um, alive. The other thing which I think on that with this what you're talking about kind of this modern idea that these are just blips in the road with resilience these kind of things will never happen again and yet they're all predictable surprises right this we we know these yeah. things are, are happening is it seems to me that maybe some of our organizations have uh, entered into a a failure of imagination somehow we've got these processes and things and we just can't think outside the little box or even just outside our recent history you don't have to go back very far or in fact you don't even sometimes not even history if you just look around the world to what is actually is actually happening uh do you think there is this kind of failure of imagination or or how would you say the role of of, of thinking bigger and, and wider particularly in terms of of resilience is planning out Oh, that's that's our question of the moment, really, in emergency planning. I often attribute a lot of my ability to both be, you know, effective as a planner, but also to have been, I think, quite prescient in the things that I've predicted to uh, just a really good imagination. 
imagination kind of fostered by lots of love of story and and fiction and non-fiction and I you know I joke in the book that I was very much a child of certain types of telly in the UK so watching you know Casualty and watching Brookside and all the things that can happen and also you mentioned right at the start that I spent a lot of time with my aunt and my uncle who were both coroners and coroners in their inquest process so they look at how and why and when uh, somebody died but they also look at the kind of circumstances around that and they often they're often a little bit like a, a mini episode of casualty themselves you know maybe if the ladder hadn't been against the rickety wall type thing the person wouldn't have fallen off so there's an awful lot of kind of joining the dots that I do um and imagination is is woefully lacking in 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 my field but more importantly I think very difficult in central government and w- one of the things that one of the places that I go to in the book is that it's become more and more difficult to use what we would call in emergency planning the reasonable worst case scenario. So tell you know, paint me a paint me a picture of your of your you know a reasonably worst day. You know, there's no aliens in there, but it's it's pretty bad. And what happened was that became uh, about a political football. You know, so I'm on record talking about we we um in 2009 i was raising the concern i raised it at a, an irish emergency planning conference and it was it was written up and on the on the internet which i'm very glad about because it puts a date stamp on it and i raised a concern that we you know we were planning for a, a difficult exit from europe but our pandemic plans were being kind of pushed into the long grass and we you know the idea was being put out by by central government in england that you wouldn't get a pandemic at the same time as a no deal brexit and that's that's a failure of imagination and we see this term failure of imagination we first saw it in the the, the uh, commission report into 911 and it, it's for me it's one of the biggest issues um uh, people like their scenarios very safe and very optimistic um and 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 also i'm starting to use it to challenge other things you know it's not a failure of imagination to imagine for example what happens if we don't get to net zero you know failure of imagination works very well with climate change discussions because you have to be able to explore rather than as you you said right at the start you know hopium is a big issue in emergency response if we don't if we don't hit some of these targets if we exceed some of our concerns you know if we don't put the mitigations in place for certain things okay right that let's let's accept that as a reasonable worst case scenario let's imagine what that looks like and plan accordingly it stands you imagination stands you very well i think as well in your kind of personal and family life so you 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 kind of um you 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 know you picture um uh, what might go wrong and you mitigate or you can also it's also we talked a little bit about joy and hope it's a way of it's a way of picturing what 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 a good thing might look like as well so i think imagination is very much linked to in the business world what we might call kind of scouting and foresight yes so one of the um one of the hats i wear is i i write plays i make theater and actually my current show which is coming uh, around again in in january 2024 uh, is around death and it's part co- stand up comedy part one man show uh, but you get to plan my own funeral so I now have a joke that I'm the only person who's been to their own funeral five times because oh, we wonderful. sort of we kind of yeah. talk about what music you would choose, what images. And it is this sense of just imagination for things, well, around death, which are definitely going to happen. So that's not uh, yeah. that's not an issue. I think climate's really interesting. So I do quite a lot of work o- around here as well. And I think one of the problems we've come across is actually the way that a lot of our standard fiction and our standard stories happen if our fiction seems too close to the real world and then the extraordinary we say that would never happen that's only science fiction that's only fantasy yeah. it, it, you know, if i'd wrote a little um fiction story about what's happened around grenfell particularly post brexit or post that amount of time yeah it would have been dismissed as completely unbelievable there is yeah. no way this would happen we are not going to publish this as a fiction story and then it happens in real life yeah. so you can't yeah. countenance it so there has been something which has happened where we can only believe it as as, as science fiction um and not as real uh, as real so that's something to do with that part of story definitely maybe that's a good segue into perhaps a couple of more um, personal um, aspects. Uh, thinking about story, do you have a particular writing process? Because your writing is really uh, beautiful. And Thank you. It is 
what we I guess would call life writing or non-fiction writing but it is very stylish and every chapter tells stories they tell your stories they tell other people's stories um do you have a process everyone's got a different process are you like <laughs> right in first evening morning <laughs> notebook are you a, a thing for that yeah. how do you how do you write what's your writing process oh that's a lovely question and it goes back as I think as well to your earlier point about you know trying to write with academic writing you know I, I I think the article that you're referring to I think was in in production for four years I struggle terribly with academic writing and I think there's uh, somewhere on my wall I've pinned a review for an earlier piece of academic writing that says you know credit should be given to the author because English is clearly not her first language uh, we all know reviewer two in the academic world is particularly brutal my PhD thesis I really discovered ethnography and, and autoethnography and um, I was very lucky that uh, the School of Medicine at Lancaster University was very was very supportive of exploring ethnography and very which is very um, intimate attention to detail, but also centering yourself in the writing, and that. Uh, released me I mean we had to sort of you know the, the things we had to do we had to get permission for my thesis to be in the first person and that became my academic monograph the recovery myth um, we had to you know at every stage up to Viva and even at Viva although they had very supportive examiners you're justifying the first person in writing which of course isn't isn't true in, in memoir or life writing of course you'd be writing in the first person Person. But what I discovered was how much I love that, <laughs> which is a slight death knell to being an academic. You know, I still have an academic, but blimey, do I struggle with not being able to write. Um, you know, there were some real inspirations in my writing, which were perhaps, uh, you know, perhaps a, a very uh, obvious they were people like Patricia Cornwell and Stephen King so they were huge influences and um, I had also started to really enjoy the professional confessional type memoir the the revelation memoir the non-fiction um the the celebrity non-fiction that was much more um uh, as you say much more kind of life writing much more true to self and I just one one I was on an academic writing retreat and a colleague who very sadly is no longer with us um and I were having a coffee in the afternoon and I said my brain is you know there's nothing coming out I can't write this paper and she said well write write what you want to write and that became the uh the prologue that became the that opening chapter and I never showed it to anybody and then like halfway through the I'd got the book deal and I was putting in chapters and my editor was saying to me we need a chapter that sets the scene and I attached it to an email and sent it in and she was like my goodness where's that been hiding um there's 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 different <laughs> I, I do follow religiously all of the the good proper writers on twitter who tell who tell me how to do it i know i'm supposed to try and get a few words down every day and i know i'm supposed to have have times of the day it was quite revelatory writing up my thesis i went to a writing workshop and they said find your golden hours the hours in the day when you when you can just flow and don't have your computer connected to the internet and just write and my golden hours are between about 5 and 7 a.m which is horrible for the household and then it, as the day wears on i get sort of less creative and i just do my editing or whatever um but there's different there's different chapters have been written in different Different ways and one of the ones that I'm you know I really remember with a kind of energy was I was so grateful to Hodder and Stoughton that they they let me write about flooding because flooding is just this grim chronic aftermath that we're going to see so much of in the UK so I really wanted to write about flooding and, and and I felt it was brave of them because it wasn't the big dramatic types of disasters that I was writing in other chapters and I wanted to meet a deadline, but also we had a new dog. And if I went downstairs, the dog would bark and wake the whole household up. So I sat on the bathroom floor, <laughs> cramped legs and just powered through that chapter. And I think there's an energy. It becomes, you know, it becomes the uh, Hiraith chapter. There's an energy to that that always makes me smile when people say, you know, kind of what's your technique? Because sometimes it's very much built by circumstance. There's bits written on the train um and uh you know there's there's uh bits there's bits written uh exactly as we're supposed to in in my golden hours and then the other thing you know i found i think having having been through the rigors of and the brutality of academic writing i had huge respect from the outset for the editorial process and 
so when people said to me uh, that goes or that doesn't work there I just listened to it and I'm so glad I did because I think what you get is a is a quite a tight narrative and a, a coherent narrative which was something before the book I think I would have said I struggled with <laughs> and do you write a uh, longhand by notebook and then into computer or straight into computer or it, it seems like it varies it doesn't it doesn't bother you it kind of I have I love a out. notebook I do have a notebook of ideas I I my main uh, my main business expenditure is very nice notebooks. I do have notebooks for initial ideas. And then I get very upset because I'll get a smudge in them from my pen and then I don't want to use it anymore. I'm terrible. I'm very obsessed about my notebooks. But then it's, it is, it's 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 on the, the laptop. And what I do, I, I've always done this, is it's like a shuttle launch. I get the workspace set up and, I'm gonna, and I've got inspirational quotes on the wall and these are the books I'm going to refer to. And then don't do that at all. I sit in front. And, and the way my brain works, this is a terrible confession that you lured out of me but the, I quite often need something on in the background so people people will say to me how can you have been both producing an article that's out in the independent tomorrow and you also seem to know all of your selling sunset gossip and it's because I have it on at the same time and I think it's that thing about having all the tabs open I can write which I know people find abhorrent the idea that you would have that much background noise but I write better if I've got a something fun on the telly over here <laughs> and then I just sit and write stuff so yeah I I'm fascinated by process and when the book came out I did a lot more literary festivals and things and I realized how much how much uh, newer writers and, and aspiring writers really hang on to the idea of process and I felt a bit I felt a little bit of a fraud there because I sort of sat with with my um, Mac Air and selling Sunset <laughs> no this I've now um I've interviewed I, I would probably say hundreds of uh, creatives in some form. And uh, the one dominant thing is that there is almost no process yeah. um, that is for certain. Now, maybe there's some <laughs> in the sense that you, if you're a writer, you need at some point to write words. And if you don't yeah. manage to get words yeah. down, you don't have anything. Yeah. But it can be at 5 a.m. or 5 p.m. You can yeah. uh, want yeah. silence. You can want a lot of noise. You could, some people use notebooks. Some people go straight to computer and, and all of that. So but one of the things i guess is you, you have to do it uh, what one last one on your on your writing because um i think it is so beautiful you have a lot of beautiful sentences and i just wonder yeah. at the level of the sentence do you do you hone and re-edit and obviously you will have editors who do things this or do the sentences come out mostly fully formed when you're writing them your particularly beautiful ones are you kind of at the level of the sentence going back and back and back or they they kind of flow out because you've you've had it all up in your mind and you've now got the time and it's all coming coming through. Well, you probably don't really think about it, right? But is that but at the level of the sentence, you've got so some such beautiful uh, ones and the phrasing is different. I mean, it's almost towards poetry, but it was within, within prose. Uh, but to someone who's sensitive to writing, it definitely uh, jumps out as in this is someone who has written special sentences throughout the book. <laughs> I that means an absolute that means the world I, I definitely I you know like I said I listen closely to my editors I think also you know there was a there was a there was a, t a technique that had certainly been beaten out of me in academic writing but I'd always loved in in things like Stephen King's writing which was maybe that last that last sentence in a chapter would kind of kick you in the guts I really all you know like you know I think there's lines where he'll say uh you know, Susan Jones really enjoyed her last breakfast and you know that things are going to get really grim in the next chapter. I really, I, I like the power of a last sentence or, and I, and, and I liked, um, it's interesting now I've been to see again because the book's thrown me into this wonderful world of, of literature that I hadn't been exposed to for a long time. I've been to a lot more poetry workshops and poetry events over the last year. And I've realized, you know, how much I like alliteration and how much I, I like, you know, kind of, um, uh, a trailing off uh, stream of adjectives and, and description and 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 um, yeah and the power of holding hold you know constructing a sentence um, that 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 is quite clashing and that was really important I think for some of the the content that goes to more difficult areas some of the things about for you know kind of you might say the more forensic areas um, and what the editors would do for me there is they would say, uh, go away and write. Just, you know, we're not going to be scared. We're not going to be horrified. Write everything that you felt, you know. And so I, I quite like a sentence that maybe has a clash. Um, 
And and the best thing about the book for me was it something for the first time had finally captured what happens if I go and speak somewhere. And I'd never been able to marry the two. I'd never been able to get the the writing to, to match up to the kind of way that I like to speak about things. And I think the other thing was, um, you know, there's a lot of a uh, lot of noise in the world and and when you speak about these things people are moving on to the next thing all the time I wanted to grab attention and and so there's yeah I, I, nobody's described it quite like that before so I thank you for that because it means a lot well when I <laughs> met you and heard you in person I thought this is definitely the person who's written this book you you are <laughs> like nah she's not used to ghost right like this this, this is her which you can sometimes <laughs> see it's like you know you always like little yeah. wonder like, yeah you know, I but, know like, no. I, I, this is this is her voice. Yeah, you know, he's got her different. That's a lovely thing to um, say and very validating. <laughs> but yeah, no, um, definitely not. <laughs> I'll, I'll quote one. Well, actually, I'll, I'll reflect on one other thing because your writing, particularly on some of those harder parts, are neither super clinical nor morbid, nor have they kind of gone so lyrical that you just think that this has got you know off towards high <laughs> art. And there was a sentence on disaster, which I just pulled out because it really struck, um, partly just because of its construction. Disasters are about total loss, tangible losses of a person, a house, a place, and intangible losses of a feeling of safety, trust in authority. And just the way you have these contrasts mm -hmm. and the losses come back and the tangible and intangible, it's just a kind of normal-ish sentence that coming, coming through on that. The other thing about your writing, which came through to me, is it seemed to be rooted in, say, yes, your childhood, yes, Liverpool, but also working class and also feminism or or being a, a woman. And I was interested to how much that has been influenced, you know, this idea that the working class voices are often not that well understood, not well represented. Um, and I think you can say the argument is the same for female voices uh, even today. How important is that to you? And is that a theme which kind of sat at the surface of your writing or is it just more of an undercurrent because of the fact that that is who you are? Yeah, it's a really interesting one because I, I think... Um... Uh, you sometimes only after you put something out that you you or, so, or or when you're kind of slightly pushed or tested on something do you realize where your activism lies and there was there was definitely because the other thing of course is, as you know with it with a with a process like this goes out into the world and people draw different things from it so the 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 role of the woman in emergency planning has definitely been something that people have really picked up in that and um you know there's certainly i think six or seven times in the book where i make a clear distinction that by by perhaps you know you you talked earlier about how difficult it is to sell something that's only a story and i make the point in the book that you know that I, I'm called a hysteric. I'm called a fantasist. I didn't want it to sort of beat people over the head, and also I wanted it to be very clear that you know this was very much a book of allyship. Uh, you know, lots lots of people working working together. Um, but certainly, there's a theme in the book I think of the unheard voice, which is a very important theme for me across the gamut. In in you know we're seeing it in the COVID inquiry, we're seeing it in other disaster inquiries constantly. Who gets their voice heard at the table and why was probably the the bigger theme for me. And then I think you know since the book's been out. I think partly because sometimes I'll deal with it in quite a light and and very, you know, very uh, perhaps quite uh, gently combative way. It's been it's been a chance to explore through things like like magazine articles and things how uh, women and in, in my case. Uh, I talk a lot about advising in the pandemic and there was a very, very uh, privileged, wealthy lens on how people would respond to something like lockdown. And, you know, when you come from a place like Birkenhead, you you certainly know that no, nobody, uh, you know, it, it is going to get through lockdown easily. You know, you, you, you've you responded to the Grenfell disaster. You understand uh, challenges around housing and lack of garden. And the point that I'm making in both the book and then in, in, in some of my social media is trying to penetrate places like uh, Westminster with the idea that people have very different lived experiences on the ground. Um, and just, uh, yeah, just the, I think the biggest thing for me would be challenging uh, the, the who gets heard 
and that uh, you know another aspect of that is um we are very very bad at listening to any group that probably isn't uh yeah there's a long history in emergency planning of a lens of of white male heterosexual it's great to see um that being challenged more and more in my field of practice and very very robustly another thing which comes through uh, um, and maybe it comes through even more in in person um is the fact you're very funny <laughs> you're like that <laughs> and all of that and th- there is a like thing yeah. through the book but obviously <laughs> it's kind of shadowed by all of the um hope loss disaster and yeah, you had to take but, out some of the yeah, jokes <laughs> yeah but I, I mean I guess this is it because that's the other thing having been a bystander or just really close to all of this that I guess you call it gallows humor but actually it's 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 strangely really important to get through if you can't laugh and I found some of the the acquaintances or friends or peers of that who just somehow couldn't find something to laugh about have really suffered more I I don't know you know maybe it's a kind of almost uh I wouldn't want to say condition because you're just seeing a certain lens through it but this ability uh, to laugh through things and and another thing which happens I, maybe it's every two or three chapters maybe not quite of that um is you seem to get pranked a lot and <laughs> yes. I was interested in <laughs> what's the best prank the worst prank and do you actually end up pranking anyone else or are you just always the one who goes yeah that's right I'll just I'll just walk <laughs> naked in this suit around this site because I trust the forensic people to have my back or, or whatever <laughs> that is um yeah I know best prank worst prank and <laughs> do, uh, yeah. do you end up pranking anyone else well it's 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 a and it's a really good point I think about the humor because um when I started in the field there was definitely uh you know there was definitely a recourse to gallows humor and there's even been kind of journal and scientific articles written about gallows humor and and I, what I'm always very clear on and, th- and this is very genuine is is for me, the humor is never ever, as you can imagine, about the incident or anybody affected by it. But what we are is a very, you know, it's a very in, intimate collaborative, I think, a disaster response team in whatever guise it takes. We're very self deprecating. And in the same way as we go to those basic, you know, basic needs that people need in disaster we're also looking after each other so a lot of a lot of pomp and ceremony is stripped back you know and people are looking after each other and you know making sure they've got the paracetamol they need or whatever so it, it, it's very very uh there's a lot of camaraderie it's, it's very militaristic in that way i think and um for me the the humor i mean probably for all sorts of reasons some of the funniest moments uh, as i say never at the instant mainly at my expense should uh probably uh stay uh locked in the in the annals of my memory um i uh very rarely uh i don't i can't think i've ever pranked anybody the the one thing i do remember in the book is is falling for um so i say in the book that we often use um uh, celebrities in our disaster scenarios I don't because I think it causes all sorts of confusion but it's quite a common thing to do and uh they um you know I, I run upstairs and, and I've had this uh this this notification that we've had a major plane crash and all of the Spice Girls are on it and I run upstairs and activate all of my colleagues and um they point out that actually no it, you know just ring the bring the airline back and check that it's an exercise and of course fortunately it, for for the history of pop fortunately it, it definitely was so there's always those moments and and, the, and then you sit back and think gosh what a what a crazy day we have some I do um I do tweet moments that are slightly more um they've got that levity in them so we have what's called the Lucy injury which is when I put into a scenario something that I consider perfectly possible but my colleagues will often uh often uh, laugh at that scenario um and so we tend to have a lighter um experience now there's a group of us on Twitter that will also uh pick a, a disaster movie and tweet through it um and and tweet the moments and, and we'll, we'll you know we're, we're quite uh we're quite skeptical sometimes and quite quite harsh on various uh movie uh creators but it's interesting the point of the 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 lightness I I know it's I know it's so trite and it you know it belongs only on bathroom walls but the the phrase kind of live love laugh was always that's always how I've done working in this field you know how fragile life is and 
you um laugh i think differently as an emergency planner you you take this this everything tastes uh, more intense everything everything you, you love differently you laugh differently and you live differently and i just think that that's what what gets you through and we've just had a big major event for the emergency planners and one of the things that we talked about was how you know we haven't really done much face to face stuff for 4 years and it was like demobbing from a war you know it was so lovely to see everybody and i've just seen the edits of the award ceremony that we did a kind of lighthearted award ceremony and all you could hear is me laughing and we needed that <laughs> i mean it's a great part of the book because it it sits in really great counterpoint uh, to all the loss that we um that we read about Another element which comes through uh, in the book is some of your stories of personal loss, which I think you could have edited out. And some of this is around uh, miscarriage and some of it is around um, your own uh, personal. Uh, I don't know whether you want to comment on why you left that in. Like obviously it's obviously interlinked very much with who you are and, and how that through and through is. And it does seem to me um, we've it's been taboo subjects again. It's a it's a it's a motherhood yeah. subject that we kind of don't talk about probably for the wrong reasons. Uh, but it's a very strong theme, uh, and I I don't know whether you reflect on it today and whether that's also been very meaningful to um, uh, mothers or people who'd like to be mothers who'd been been reading the work. And was it really important for you to keep that in and and to explain how that made you feel? Yeah, again, thank you for that. Yes, it was. And, and that's one, certainly when the book goes kind of out on the road and you're doing the book festivals, that's where, that's a great connector, you know. And again, it's a bit like your experiences with disasters and the disaster statistics. One woman might never experience pregnancy loss and one woman might experience 10 pregnancy losses. You know, it's not an equal spread. So you end up meeting women out on the road and, and their partners who are, it was the first time they explained it. And when I originally wrote my PhD thesis, I wrote a chapter about, I mentioned before, this kind of intimate ethnography that I was doing. And the whole time that I was doing my field work for my PhD, in some form or other, I was in early pregnancy and I lost several pregnancies. And what that did was I was working on the flood recovery that I was writing about, but it endeared I think the, the other women affected by the flood, they 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 change their relationship with me. You know, they get me a chair, they get me a cup of tea. And so I wrote this chapter about, you know, intimate autoethnography and I took it out because th that wasn't what the thesis was about. And what was important to me was it it is relevant, I think, to who I am as an emergency planner. It's relevant. It's it's very relevant to who I am as a woman. It was very relevant to me and Tom. But also there were these very important parallels, like the same, the form that I was asked to fill in when I would lose a, an early pregnancy is the same form that I'd helped design for disaster response. We essentially use the same kind of, you know, what would you like done with the tissue? It's the same. It's the same form. So you would go from workshops on the Monday to how you would use this form in practice to filling it in on the Thursday. And I thought that was that was really important to me. And and it 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 also kind of um it it allowed me to have discussions about again going back to the earlier point about being a woman in this field and kind of keeping some of this from the wider world. Um and I, I, it, it, you know, as with all editorial processes, I think, you know, that you, you write it and then it just made, it made sense. And I, um, yeah, I mean, some people have said to me, is, did you feel it was, it was too much? And I, 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 I'm very comfortable, but the nicest thing for me was, and it still happens. I mean, it happened only last week is actually particularly partners of women who say that the way that I've described it has for the first time given them an insight uh, into what their partner um, uh, loses, what 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 the, the products of conception, as they're uh, euphemistically called, feel like to lose. And so I've had some lovely thank you letters, particularly from men, and that, that was enough. That was justification, really. Does Tom read your work? Uh, before it goes out and things you I think you describe him as a man of fewer words and <laughs> he's a really important presence not the one where there were so many words written about and I think my impression is family and him in particularly I, I think you use the word scaffold in yeah. one of your notes and that seemed really uh, just such a correct word I don't know if you wanted to have a little comment on the importance of Tom 
either to you <laughs> or how it is a theme through uh, the book. And there were other pieces of loss um, around that uh, as well. You know, our relationship with our work and our relationship with how all of that uh, works. But yeah, I just wanted to note that there was a really important piece of of scaffold there. And it that definitely comes through the book about how that is a, an anchor for all parts of your life as well. Yeah, that's that. That's a, it's it, it's funny because it's such an important theme, and I think again that was a, a reason for talking about the pregnancies as well because that's a two person, and in fact, of course, wider family, grandparents and others as well. Um, that's a that's a two person journey, and there was a you know there was a lovely theme that I'm able to draw out of basically not bringing work home. You know, I met a prison officer this week who'd read the book, and they were saying saying that that was the part that made them go out and buy the book for their partner because they wanted to say, you know, she Lucy does something different, but it's got that same thing that I might come home and be a bit difficult or a bit inside my own head, but this is why. So one of the lines that I have the most response to actually is the line that says the hardest part of working in disaster is going home. So, uh, you know, it was a, it was an acknowledgement and an appreciation of maybe how difficult that was. He, he didn't read my work and also didn't really um, tend to know what I was up to and then for legal reasons when the book was just about to be published he had to prove he'd read it and signed a disclaimer so that was quite funny and um uh and he said so very similar to actually what my dad said my dad my dad basically very honestly said well I, I bought a copy when it was out he said because um you know it's you you're my daughter he said but what I didn't expect I didn't expect it to be a page turner <laughs> And and Tom said something similar, like, you know, I don't like reading, but this is this is really good. So he was pleased and he, he I remember him he was reading it in bed and he shut it and he just put it down the bed and he went, Blimey. <laughs> I'll always remember that. But he is, he is the scaffold and he he was kind of, you know, one of the things that I think, uh, again, a lot of people have responded to at the book festivals and 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 in discussion of it is um you can do anything when you're coming home to scaffold you know coming home to support i don't get i don't get carried away because that's how you rattle the fates mm. <laughs> he's probably he's has gone very quiet so he's probably leaving me out there somewhere but he's he you know that you that people would say well how, where's the strength come from well where does the joy come from well you know it's coming home to him but the joy as well was also that he didn't he, this was not his world i i have i used to be quite envious of, of colleagues and couples who were both say police officers i was like how brilliant must it be for you to be able to sort of share your day and now i think through the process of writing the book i've realized what a gift it was to not bring that home um so yes his 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 view was um was very important and, and and continues to be on it really and it's his book as well I think that that's the other thing you know there's a big theme about him towards the end which I won't spoil but also there's a the the babies were his too so he's a huge part of that yeah that's very important um I guess turning back to the whole area of disaster what do you think is perhaps most misunderstood either in and around disaster or in and around what uh, disaster responders or planners do? Oh, well, I think the biggest issue we have, and I name it in the book after the, the most recent James Bond films, I do genuinely think that the skyfall effect is a huge problem in disaster management. And this is the idea that, that like this amazing capability is coming over the hill to save us. It's one of the problems we have with climate change as well. It's not. It's people like me and my colleagues and there's a team club and there's a there's a um you know there's a basement in a town hall where we use a lot of excel spreadsheets um i always get asked you know to um to do like quick summaries of my day or would i wear a body camera so people could see what exciting stuff i do and i'm like i might literally just be on a, a phone for an hour talking about a flood rescue strategy you know we you know with whiteboards and microsoft word it's not always very glamorous and there's this huge misperception i think of of what we what we have at our disposal but of course the other side of that is uh what we also have at our disposal that we perhaps underestimate is just the amazingness of each other and you know one one thing i find very difficult watching something like the covid inquiry is that by 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 necessity and for many understandable reasons it will tell the stories of what went wrong but if you're me and you plan for a pandemic since 2004 you also got to see all the things that went much better than we ever dared hope. You know, I write a lot about things like our death care professionals, our registrars, our mortuary staff, our funeral directors, who far exceeded 
the the best case in our plans the the, the supermarkets far exceeded the best case scenarios we had and that's not the story we'll tell so i think sometimes we both simultaneously underestimate the uh, fellow humans and overestimate the kind of quality of you know the kind of uh, avengers response yeah. that we're going to get that really resonates with me particularly in uh, also when climate work that like you mentioned the um, technology itself will not save us on mm -hmm. the other hand, we can save us because yeah. it will only come from us. So you don't want to be in a position of helplessness thinking, well, I can't do anything, so I'm not going to do anything. On the other hand, you also don't want to say, well, it's just going to be done by someone else. Some other yeah. technology is, is going to come along. So you've got this interesting dilemma between actually, well, it may be some form of technology, but that's only going to be driven and powered by the people. And you can't let it just be, you can't just let it be someone else yeah absolutely. maybe that dovetails into the last kind of a uh, few questions uh, one was kind of around um what people or organizations can do so i've read in your work you know the things like citizens aid and things that you can do uh, and maybe on a sort of personal level you might want to think about some of these situations that you, that you might have and i was wondering any reflections on that and then maybe at one level up uh, most of us work for organizations of some sort so either small or, or large I guess the larger ones normally think of some sort of planning but it's usually to do with if the internet goes down or something like that yeah um so sort of back up is are there any thoughts that you have for maybe if you're working with a smaller or medium-sized organization or, or even up into the larger ones about how we should be be thinking about this i mean it's, it's not something that you know you need to spend you know 50 percent of your time on but a, a little bit of time or resource seems to be able to go a long way particularly because you know one of the themes i talked about right at the start is that a lot of these are kind of predictable surprises you you don't know exactly what the surprise will be but you will you'll know it i do quite a lot of work in healthcare and i've been in sort of 20 years and speaking to uh virologists they're saying yeah, some sort of viral pandemic every 10 to 20 years is roughly what we would expect, whether that's yep. a, a different yep. kind of flu or a different kind of virus. Uh, we can't tell you exactly what year it will be, but it will happen. And I guess yep. the same you can think about people living around San Francisco. They don't know when in the next 100 or 200 years that there will be some sort of earthquake, but it seems extremely likely that there will be. And so they think about that. But actually, it seems to be the same at the at the company or the or the personal level so i don't know if you had any reflections about what we should think about yeah so at the, you know taking the second one first i think one of the things that we often do in emergency management is is we sell to our kind of executive team that these are really good these are really good kind of business ideas anyway you know being it, it often improves the quality of other types of planning if you're if you're looking at uh the kind of foresight issues and you're looking at risk um and and the the, the, the you know the fairly easy sell is that risk management is part of uh effective strategic management um i it's an interesting one i've been introduced recently at a couple of conferences where people have said you know if we keep getting our safety culture right and we keep getting our risks right you know lucy shouldn't be needed anymore I, I don't think that's the case you know I think we will always see um, emergencies and, and tragedies we cannot design them out completely um, so being thinking about as an organization um, how to overcome them when they do happen is important I, you know I, I'm we're, we're following very seismic events at the moment and that's an example where people will have very high expectations of the warnings they're given and when and when we know and how much we know and do you know what that's what it is to live on this mother earth isn't it and her do her thing all the time so one of the difficulties i think is is making your peace with the idea of of constant uh, environmental and seismic and a socio-technical challenge the, the 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 lessons for both households and businesses are the same and, and preparedness is a win you know you you it's it's, there's really the only downside to it is that sometimes done badly people will feel scared so if you if you go in and go oh my goodness where's your insurance and have you done all of this people will feel unnerved but looking at things like uh, what they would do in certain scenarios um thinking about prepping a go bag um looking at your insurance cover whether you're a household you know so many households now are underinsured um looking at your insurance as a business these are just make good sense so I think um, that's probably one of the things that I would I would most like to encourage. And I tweet regularly 
um, you know, ideas about going into the winter um doing a both an adult first aid course and a pediatric first aid course uh, learning about citizen aid which is how to support with more kind of catastrophic uh, uh medical injuries all of those kind of things um knowing where your defibrillator is and just upping your, your, your level of preparedness skills really so I, I go into some places i do a lot of site visits and i'm i'm often feeling quite comforted when i kind of see a kind of safety culture again depending on the site and industry mm. and and you've mm. you've mentioned this you can kind of sense it you know the signs are clear they're well yeah. kept and all of these type of things but on occasion I've gone to places which have some of this or even all of this but it's tipped over slightly into tick box so they've yeah. set it all up but they've actually forgotten the kind of the bit about the preparedness is, is that other layer is there something to do with how we don't want to make it a bureaucracy because we kind of wanted to make it a slightly living thing. And I guess there is a slight tension sometimes. Oh, uh, so I got to do it in the extreme. So Silicon Valley sometimes says we got to move fast and break things. And I always kind of think, well, can we not just move quite quickly and just not break anything <laughs> rather than you know, <laughs> that seems to be much more sensible yeah. you know, with that sort of thing. But there is maybe a little bit of a tension. I don't I, I don't think there is with actually true um um, being prepared because as you say I think that's sort of sensible but where can it go wrong in terms of like well just getting a tick box culture and a bureaucratic culture and how do you have this tension between the risk and opportunity side because on one hand if we never took any risk you know you never leave the house you know you don't do yeah you don't do anything so it's a kind of tension to to think about and because I've met some people also who I would say at the margin are perhaps a little bit too scared like there's actually yeah. you also have to live your life and and deal with yeah. the fact that risk is all around us and yeah. this is um, yeah. accepting that so I don't know if you have any thoughts or comments about that balance and bureaucracy and, and how you should think about risk but also the reward about you know going out and and living life yeah and it's such a it's such a challenge you know the the, the biggest evaluation I think I did was once I became a parent because then it's you know, how do you not um, impose on those beautiful children that need to go out and live their lives and, and do their own adventures? Um, how do you not uh, impose those worries on them? And that's 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 been a really interesting uh, balance for me. So both of mine are very active and both of them are into quite uh, quite <laughs> high risk, you might say, high risk sport. And so you you have to you have to you know, there's a, that's a true test of, of letting people live their own lives, do their own risk assessment. Um, you know, I don't I remember a young youth worker saying to me many years ago it's you that's not normal <laughs> and she was quite glad that you know people didn't worry about the risk all, all the time you have to live and, and there's you know we wouldn't get innovation we wouldn't get excitement the the, the nasa kind of you know the bravery and, and the and the and the uh the ambition that goes with risk taking so i'm i'm all for i'm all for a quite kind of quite risk tolerant society but that does its assessment well that does its mitigation well and then as you say something that's very important to me is the the overt signs of safety culture so I'm very interested in an organization where you know if I go into somewhere and, and they've got their very good food standard rating food hygiene rating on the wall but I can see the staff are miserable you know there's other indicators aren't there that we all use to look I also um I've also talked a lot more recently and I've just done a, a big interview on it about instinct the power of instinct in our guts you know where the ancient Greeks believed all our emotions lived you know knowing knowing when something's very wrong, uh, which I talk about in the roller coaster chapter. So I think I think um it is a it is a really difficult one. And um the other thing that's happening is people have had their risk calibration completely discombobulated by the by the pandemic. This was something to be very wary of, but what we did as a as a nation and several nations followed the same sort of path is we terrified our public. So what would have felt like something in their gift to weigh up, they're now very afraid. And now we continue to terrify them. You know, the world's gone to hell in a handcart. Here's an environmental crisis. You can't swim in your own river. We're constantly bombarding people with 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 information that makes them afraid. And that has, a, as you know, mentioned before, has a, a, um, a fundamental effect on parts of the brain. So one of the things I think um, I would would recommend people do is um, remind themselves, as I do towards the end of the book, that the world has always been like this. Um, focus inwards, focus on, on what's controllable. But um, 
uh, you know, going back to that earlier point, you can't let it get in the way of, of life and living. Yeah, I, th- I think that's really right. That's one of the reasons I started with a question on hope, because I strongly believe that in the long run, fear is not a winning strategy, not regardless of everything else. No, if you want it, like, no. And governments or organizations or even people uh, use fear at at actually great long term cost. Yeah. And I think we've, we've learned that people know, but obviously in, in the moment there there is that. Um, and your one comment on normal, there's, there's a there's a phrase I like, which is that everybody is somebody's weirdo. So yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. About, like, yeah. Uh, and that and that's how we have it. But if you could, if you found the true normal, that would probably be the yeah. weirdest thing ever. If yeah, you could, if you could, uh, if you could really find it. Okay, last couple of questions on, on this. Then. So one was going back to uh, Grenfell, and another will just be on in general life advice or thoughts that you have. Um, I just wanted to finish on this because you know, investigations are ongoing and things. And we have, I guess what I would say is the direct cause, like the first order cause by a refrigerator, I think, and and things like that. Uh, But when I talk around in my community, there's a lot of the anger is going up a level. And so you can talk about the building and the construction and the the policy Mm -hmm. and that. And then you can even go up another level because there is this systems piece that we seem to have which weighs against so many types of groups. So whether that's poverty, whether these are immigrants, people who don't speak uh, the language of English and all of these uh, type of things. And I, and I think that's where you get a lot of this sense of injustice that you go, okay, we have a proximal cause, like it was poor, a poor police officer or a poor policing decision, but that comes from this system of policing or things that we have in a hierarchy mm-hmm. we think about. And we have poor housing and poor individual building, but it seems to be a system about how we think about social housing or how we treat uh, poor people and and things like that. So obviously there is no uh, consensus uh, solution for this, because if there was, uh, I think we would be pursuing about it. But given that you have been in so many of these events and communities and things, do you have a thought on that systems piece as well about what we should be thinking about or how we could be doing, which takes us from one cause up from yes, poor cladding and yes, poor buildings. But is there something we can do on this systems piece or the social politics that means that we could try and make these better decisions for the things and listen to people when they say they've got problems with within all of that? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, that, that this is where you get quite radical as a disaster planner because these are terrible acts of, of what is essentially state violence. And the only way to explore uh, improving that is to, in some ways, challenge and, and even perhaps tear at um, some very ex- existing systems. And, you know, you mentioned how many disasters I've seen and how many inquiry reports that I've also seen that go with them. And the themes are always the same. There's very similar themes in Grenfell as there were in Hillsborough, very similar in, in Southall, very similar in Marshness. I can just list places for you. So the one, you know, one of the things for me is there is a fundamental requirement to to agitate. Um, one of the reasons I've been independent since 2004, I have my own business, is because if you if you get involved in disaster response, they're inherently political and they're usually embarrassing somebody and, and groups quite quite senior within the state. So you have to um, for us to really improve how the UK handle disasters and prevent them would involve us asking some very difficult questions of of where power is held and um you know there's there's big questions there as i've said before about equal voice um being able to flag early being listened to um you know uh exploring why people are ignored in the response um they are shamed and condemned when they raise these these issues and that's a very common uh theme for me and also there's often a, a sort of follow the money type angle as well. And afterwards, you know, when the when the you know what we call the tombstone imperative, when the dead have, have been have, have have been lined up, if you will, it can seem so easy and 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 uh simple to have prevented something. Um I don't think people always understand how hard it can be to try and whistleblow before something. 
and you and just as you've you know there's been a theme throughout today's uh podcast the um the the, the ability to whistleblow on a story on a hunch on an instinct and uh I still, you know, people will say now we could have prevented it this way or we could have done that or we could have done. I still don't know how you do that. Yeah. When those in power don't really want to listen, it doesn't really matter what you what you tell them. Great. Okay. Last question. What do you have as, uh, I guess, life advice or thoughts (laughs) that you'd like to share? We touched on a little bit in terms of, um, you know, uh, preparedness planning and also not living in fear and things but is there anything else you'd like to share about your experience having come across uh, some of you know some of the worst of times but also uh, the best of humans yeah oh oh there's so many things don't go to work on a row <laughs> <laughs> don't like you know just and 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 um you know one of the I think I was reflecting with a friend recently and she said you know a lot of people say that they live life as if it's precious and you might not be here tomorrow or the people you love might not be here tomorrow but but you Lucy really do and what you know what does that look like everybody I love knows that I love them you know I, I you know every time I say goodbye to my children I, I it's every time I go to work it's always uh on the premise of how fragile this is and I think if we we remember that um it sets us up to perhaps be kinder to each other um I also think um that one of the most important things to me is uh to go back to those basics about um, particularly as we go into yet another difficult winter or or, or difficult times is um, think about uh, just that couple of things that can make a difference I think people are very anxious about trying to save the whole world and you don't need to save the whole world just make somebody a cup of tea just make that tiny little kind of chaos theory difference and that's enough yeah I think I have another quote here that you you quote um on grief really but it's the sort of things is grief is best dealt with in the tiniest of incremental steps how about you make the cup of tea today shall we walk to the end of the drive let's redecorate the kitchen <laughs> yeah absolutely Ex- excellent so on that uh lucy thank you very much and i will uh, once thank again you. recommend uh the book uh thank when the dust much. settles on that uh, please do grab uh your copy and thank you very much thank you thank you for having me